All right, looks like it's six o'clock, so we can go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to an official event of the MSU Science Festival. My name is Hazel Anderson, and I'm a member of the Science Festival team. And tonight I have with me Dr. Peter Carrington, who's going to be talking to us about plants that were in history. So take it away. So uh, I have a video to play and uh, we'll, uh, we'll have this. And then at the end, we'll have uh, some time for questions or discussions. So with all of that, I believe uh, here we go. Michigan State University occupies the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabeg. Three fires confederacy of Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi peoples. The university resides on land ceded in the 1819 Treaty of Saginaw. There's a little wind noise at the first part. Welcome to the interpretive video series for the Beale Botanical Garden. We are working in the summer of the year 2020. Our purpose is to make videos that highlight some botanical subject represented by the fairly rich collection of the W.J. Beale Botanical Garden here in East Lansing, Michigan at Michigan State University. We'll be looking at a, at a number of topics and Hopefully, uh, you will be able to visit the garden where we have talks during the growing season every year when it's not shut down by an enormous planetary plant pandemic. This plant next to me here is a sedge called Cypress papyrus. Simply know it as papyrus, the plant that supplied the paper for all the Egyptian dynasties. You can see these large scapes here, but I mean these stems, they get up to twice this large. And when they're that big, they're about an inch in diameter. And if you take a sharp blade and slice them into thin sections, and then cut them to size and lay one layer one way, and the next layer on top at 90 degree angle to that, and then dry them in between sheets or something else, that's how papyrus was transformed into paper. The paper it made was exceptional in the sense that we find examples of it more than 3,000 years old that are still in good shape, can be read and retain their initial uh, cellulose structure. They last thousands of years, and so many of the writings of antiquity that have made it to today things written on paper devised from this plant. You know, toward the end of the Ptolemaic dynasties, mummies were actually manufactured on an industrial scale. And in order to accomplish the drying, sometimes books of papyrus were sacrificed and simply ripped apart and stuffed into the mummy in order to uh, facilitate drying and preservation. And lately, several ancient books that were unknown to survive into the modern era were found pretty much intact inside Egyptian mummies filled with papyrus, the amazing paper of the Egyptian dynasties. In another part of the world, ancient and also very long lasting paper this time from Japan, is manufactured from this tree. This is Brucinetia papyrifera, the paper mulberry. And what it was used for was young trunks about two inches in diameter were harvested. The bark was peeled off, hammered until the fibers came loose, and then placed in tubs of water and scrubbed until the fibers were completely dissociated in the water. Large rectangular frames of silk were put under the water and lifted up and a layer of fibers were trapped that way. They were then peeled off the screen and then dried. And that paper, again, lasted for more than a thousand years. This mulberry also has edible fruit, but it was grown for its use in paper. 
now it has reached North America. And we don't see it very often up here, up north in Michigan. But in the deep south, Alabama, Mississippi, this is a very common weed that comes up at the corner of people's lawns. Another mulberry important in world history, but for an entirely different reason, is this, the Asian white mulberry. The Asian white mulberry is important in the world because it is one of the two mulberries that are really successful when you want to raise the commercial silk moth. The commercial silk moth was a monopoly in China since ancient times until a princess who was betrothed to a prince in Afghanistan smuggled out eggs and in her garment, in the hat she wore. And thusly, there was a beginning of the spread of silkworm around the world. In colonial America, many people thought it was very important to establish an American silk industry. So bringing the Asian white mulberry, Morris Alba, to the United States was a very important first step in that. It's called white mulberry because sometimes, and it's only about probably 10 or 15% of the time, the fruit of the white mulberry, which is edible, is pure white. The rest of the time, they're a deep, dark purple, which in my personal opinion, have a much more brilliant flavor. But this was the tree brought for the food of the silk moth caterpillar. Now, since it's a completely successful invasive species, we have it all over the Eastern North America. Uh, weed fields, vacant lots in cities, people's hedges are all supporting populations of invasive white mulberry, the almost sole food of the commercial city. This plant right here is maize. Many of us call it corn. But corn is a word that English speakers use most worldwide to describe any kind of grain. It's mostly in the US and Canada that we mean specifically this plant when we say corn. And this plant is a product of the agronomic genius of the indigenous Native Americans who were here before we were. This, this plant was developed roughly 9,000 years ago. It was developed in uh, probably in one of the valleys of southern and southern western Mexico and is literally agronomic genius. And I mean that in two ways. Number one, the parents of this plant look so different that their story of their origin has only recently and with holes in it, been figured out. The parents apparently look really nothing like this. So someone either had to engineer or observe an amazing hybridization event that took place by molecular genetics only once, as far as we can tell. The other aspect of that genius is, this is a tropical plant back then. Works on short day, short night period. So it couldn't grow in North America. You see it turn up in random food supplies a few grains at a time, but clearly no one was growing this plant in temperate North America until a proper mutation was taken advantage of that allowed it to grow in long days and short nights. And it took the Native Americans genius of being able to observe and hang on to these changes, which probably didn't happen very often, in order to bring us this plant. By tonnage of grain produced, this produces more grain than any other species of crop on planet Earth. Now, much of it is diverted into animal food and now even into ethanol production, but its benefit to our species still stands. And it is the Native Americans who brought us this amazing innovation in plant life.
This plaque in the Beale Botanical Garden commemorates the, the role William James Beale had in the history of the perfection of corn. It was Dr. Beale who first developed the technique of using the double hybrid cross in order to make increases in yield in corn. He performed this by taking varieties and making them perfectly self-fertilized varieties, homozygous at every, at every point. He did this by detasseling the corn and covering the female uh, flowers, the pistillate flowers, with small paper bags so that he could control the pollination. He did that for several, uh, for each of two pairs of original varieties, very similar to the corn that Native Americans grew, mostly eight road corn. And then he took the two sets of hybrids he developed from the four original races and hybridized them to get a 24 row corn, which was then uh, an absolutely, in fact, contemporary writers called it a miraculous increase in, a, in yield. And in fact, uh, on his desk, he even had a handwritten note from Charles Darwin congratulating him on his display of the principle of hybrid vigor. And so this plaque commemorates the fact that the namesake for our garden actually had a very important role in developing what we now refer to as modern corn. And it is literally uh, one of the most successful crops in world agriculture on every continent except Antarctica. It didn't take very long for the Europeans who appropriated maize from the Native Americans to lose track of where it came from. By the 16 and 1700s, much of Europe referred to the plant we call corn as Turkish wheat. They had forgotten where it came from. And in fact, the origins of corn from so long ago were very hard to track down. Now we think we're pretty sure that this plant, Teosinte, this plant comes in both a, an annual and a perennial species, and it's not entirely clear which one was the antecedent of maize. But this plant makes fruit that looks nothing like corn. And whether it was a mutation simply within this species, or whether it was actually crossed with another plant found in that part of Mexico called Eastern gamma grass, Trypsicum dactyloides. When you hybridize Teosinte with gamma grass, you get something that's very similar to the corn as it was, as it was found in archaeological sites across Mexico. The archaeological presence of corn is mostly four to eight road corn. When one crosses Teosinte with gamma grass, you get a plant whose fruit looks very much like the four and eight road corn that dominates archeological sites showing the early stages of corn. Ultimately, corn spread from the original sites in Mexico down into South America and North up to about the Mexican American border. At that point, the problems with adapting a tropical grass to temperate warm season day length became a problem. So even though we see corn show up in archeological sites in North America from anywhere from three to 600 AD, it probably wasn't able to be grown in North America until roughly 1000 to 1100 AD. And that was the second major innovation that made corn the power of agriculture that it is today. Since then, it has adapted and uh, morphed by culture and selection into multitudes of varieties. 
probably the most primitive corns still in existence are grown amongst the indigenous peoples of South America. This is Kinopodium, also called Lamb's Quarters. This variety here is actually uh, a variety used by early indigenous peoples for food in the Eastern agricultural complex, but is virtually at this age indistinguishable from the plant that comes up almost every time you break ground in Midwest North America. Kinopodium means goosefoot. Used to have its own family, in fact. But this plant can be eaten as a salad, as a boiled vegetable. The seeds make extremely uh, good flour. Um, Napoleon Bonaparte was revered by the officer corps because he knew how to make the best biscuits made from lamb's quarter seed. And his secret? Roasting the seeds in an oven at 325 degrees for a half hour before you grind them and make flour of them. <coughs> the genus Kinopodium has contributed to human food almost everywhere in the world where it's found. The uh, varieties that were used in Europe were important foods from before the Iron Age. In fact, when you look at what are called bog people, people whose well-preserved bodies have been dug up from peat deposits, their stomach contents are, <clears throat> are very often perfectly preserved. You might remember a one called Toland Man, discovered in 1950 in Denmark on the Jutland Peninsula. His stomach contents revealed that he had eaten lamb's quarters within the same day that he died, before his body turned up in the bog. He lived in the fourth century BC. And so today, many people are trying in what they think is a new grain called quinoa. And quinoa is a lamb's quarters first domesticated by the high altitude indigenous peoples in South America, especially Bolivia. And so this is a plant that has played a huge role in human history and human food since before records were kept. This is wheat. Now, when we say wheat, we can mean anything from einkorn wheat that is very similar to the original wild grasses that were harvested for their grains especially in the Fertile Crescent of Iraq, Jordan, Israel, Middle East, all the way up to the modern bread wheat. Bread wheat is a mixture of at least six different grass species, hybridized over many years to produce this high yielding grain crop that is literally the foundation of cultivated agriculture in many parts of the world. The American West would be a completely different idea were it not for the existence of wheat. Wheat was originally discovered growing as a wild grass in huge uh, grasslands of this area that we called the Fertile Crescent. People who ended up there would have been able to grab grass literally as a wild product of incredible abundance. The agricultural historian Jack Harlan once said that he thought uh, a family group that arrived at the Fertile Crescent at the right time of summer would have been able to gather a year's worth of food with three weeks worth of harvesting work. That's unheard of in the ancient world. Most hunter-gatherer societies had to work huge parts of every day in order to keep their population fed. But to be able to harvest a wild food resource in three weeks that would benefit your group for the whole year would have made them incredibly wealthy 
by hunter-gatherer standards. This is Ceylon cotton, Gossypium arborea. This is one of several species of cotton that human beings have domesticated. When you have a culture, you generally need to have food plants as part of your agriculture, but you also need fiber plants. And fiber plants come in several flavors, one of which is utility fiber, something you can make rope or twine out of. But in more advanced cultures, you also need something to weave into cloth. So this is Ceylon cotton, one of several species that was domesticated. Of course, we know cotton as the white fluffy stuff that comes in the top of prescriptions and food supplements. It is also spun into cloth and woven into sheets and clothes and all kind of all manner of things. Cotton was domesticated independently in several different places in the world. The moche culture in Peru domesticated cotton, which came already colored right off the plant. Since then, of course, white cotton has been the dominant currency of the cotton cloth industry. Its ability to take dyes and be printed and be uh, colored in whatever manner you please has certainly dominated its usefulness in modern civilization. The only problem with growing tons of cotton is that it really takes a lot out of the soil. And so areas like the deep south of the United States that made cotton production a huge priority back in the days of enslaved people, those areas still are suffering from soil depletion from all of that cotton culture. We know it, of course, as a modern, versatile industrial product. It is still grown in many places in the world, but cotton with color right off the plant is only now starting to be revived as an agricultural product. This is tobacco, Nicotiana tobacco. Long before tobacco was noted for its disastrous health effects, this plant was harnessed by Native Americans. But as a spiritual plant, this was used in ritual and in uh, dedicating uh, the spiritual aspect of ceremonial objects. Native Americans using this in a spiritual sense, probably never came down with lung cancer or any of the deleterious effects that we know today. Because the idea that Native Americans would take a spiritual ritual plant and use it every day is probably out of the question. After it was discovered by Europeans, it was made into a daily smoking effect. Sir Walter Raleigh had a lot to do with popularizing it down in the southern colonies like Virginia. And soon it became one of the great economic forces in the colonial and later European and then later worldwide sense. Today we know tobacco as an affliction for people who are addicted to it every day. We grow it here because it can be used medicinally in patches and so forth to help use to help people actually cease smoking. Nicotine was actually used as the basis of most insecticides until the invention of modern chlorinated hydrocarbons and worse. This beautiful silvery plant next to me is actually called absinthe. Its other name is Artemisia absinthium. And it provided the magic ingredient for the beverage known as absinthe, often nicknamed the green fairy. This plant 
and the drink made from it achieved its zenith in the late 1800s when it was the darling of the Impressionist painters, amongst others. Many Impressionists came, claimed that they had wonderful visions and wonderful creative inspiration from drinking the beverage made from this plant. It's quite an interesting preparation. It was very high in alcohol. It was also high in a monoterpene called thuyon. The technique would be to take the drink and pour it through a specially designed spoon that held a sugar cube. Now, while this was very popular, it was also investigated for possible abuse and was taken off the market virtually worldwide because thuyon, that monoterpene we spoke of, was thought to cause brain damage and health problems. And so it was outlawed, its production went underground or disappeared entirely. Nowadays, it's achieving a kind of reawakening. Many countries in Europe actually allow the production of absinthe. You can actually buy it here in the US. Some of it actually made in Europe and exported to here. This plant has escaped cultivation and can now be found as a weed in many parts of Eastern North America. This is in the same group as the sagebrush famous in the American West. This plant is called pokeweed or poke salad or Indian poke or inkberry. It has a variety of names. As a toxic plant teacher, this plant is almost a whole class by itself. It has so many toxins. The toxins include a mitogen, a teratogen, uh, a cardiac glycoside, a cyanide producing glycoside. It's really quite an astounding plant, considering that in spite of all this, it was a immensely popular table vegetable, mostly in the South, up until the mid 20th century. It was cooked as a vegetable in the early spring, but you had to know exactly how to do it and how to prepare it and when to gather it uh, in order to not hurt your family and your loved ones. It's a strikingly beautiful plant. In late summer, it produces these, which turn into deep purple berries. Now, the berries themselves, the flesh of the berry is actually edible, but the seeds inside are poisonous. The problem with the seeds are that dogs learn berry picking from us. And so if you have a dog, this is not a good match uh, in your yard, in spite of how wonderful and impressive looking this plant is. This plant is in the genus Phytolacca, and there is a species of Phytolacca that live in Africa and the sap of the plant had turned out to be toxic to snails. Now, this is important in mid-Africa because snails are an important vector of river blindness, a parasite that actually passes one of its stages in snails. And by finding that their version of poke could actually be used to kill the snails in a stretch of river, meant that you could protect the women who use the river to do their laundry, to gather water for the family and so forth uh, by using the uh, berries of this plant uh, to uh, sterilize the snail population from that small stretch of river. It's a very beautiful plant. It's a perennial, but the berries are not toxic to birds. And so because of that, the seed bank in the soil is so common that almost anywhere in the Midwest or Eastern United States, where you break ground, you will see poke, pokeweed start to come up. I had the honor once of having a woman visit us in the garden who had her great grandmother's cookbook. And the beautiful thing about it was she had written it with beautiful Spencerian cursive with a quill pen and she had used for ink the berries of the pokeberry plants outside her house. And they were still unfaded, a beautiful, intense magenta color. 
and it was very beautiful uh, to see. One of the first recorded instances of chemical warfare involves this beauty next to me here. This is a rhododendron. The rhododendrons in the Anatolian region of Turkey make a kind of honey which, while it is fresh, is loaded with a group of toxins called grayanotoxins. They are neurotoxins, and if you take enough of it, it makes you look dead for about 20 hours in a row. <laughs> After which, if you're still alive, you recover and are fine. When Pompeius from Rome, the great centurion, attacked the Anatolian region of Turkey in 88 BC, the king Mithridates instructed his troops to leave pots of fresh rhododendron honey along the road while they pretended to retreat. Pompeius's Roman soldiers came along found a bunch of abandoned honey and partook deeply. And while they were all in a kind of coma from the Grayanotoxin, Mithridates soldiers came back and slaughtered them. Pompeius left, but he came back. And when he came back, he wasn't gonna fall for that poison honey routine any longer. So this <laughs> is the plant that is the source of mad honey and uh, the gray toxin is one of the predominant toxins in the blueberry family called the Ericaceae. Fortunately, blueberries don't have any of this, so we're good. <laughs> you might recognize this shrub next to me. It looks like the, the yew bushes that are our, our most common landscape plants probably in eastern North America. But this one, the short needle yew, Texas brevifolia, comes from the Pacific Northwest. It was discovered that a compound in this very toxic plant, which we now call paclitaxel, is actually immensely useful in the treatment of cervical and ovarian cancer. And so this product from this tree, from this can be a tree, but the specimen is clearly a bush, uh, has turned out to be one of the most important advances in cancer treatment. Unfortunately, it led to the stripping of the Northwest forest of this species. It was never a terribly common species and they take quite a long time to grow to maturity. So sawing down all the big ones for their uh, bark compounds was not a very auspicious move for the protection of this species. It has since been found in a fungus. It has since been found in other taxis, and it has since been synthesized entirely in the laboratory. So the pressure is off uh, taxis brevifolia pretty much for now, uh, which is a good thing because this was a, a very useful and uh, interesting member of the Northwest Forest community. Thank you for watching this edition of the Beale Garden Virtual Tours. We will have more in the series as time goes on, and we invite you to come to the garden, which is open virtually every day, uh, especially when we are not participating in a worldwide pandemic. Thank you for watching. See you next time. <clears throat>
All right. Excellent. Well, thank you uh, for coming to this presentation. Um, this actually is one of the tours that we give in the uh, Botanical Garden. Let me see here. There's the raised hand thing here. Oops. <laughs> we have a question in the Q&A. Scott Ross, will this be available online later? Um, I believe it can yes. be found on YouTube. Do, yeah. do, you, do you are you guys going to post it later on the Science Festival? Uh, yeah, it right now it's up on Facebook and eventually it will be on YouTube as well. Okay, so, well, yes. okay, right now, right now. Oh, let's and see. there's a question in the Q and A. Are there any books you can recommend about the history of plants and civilization? Uh, that's a very good question, and I don't know of any that are specifically about that, um, but I'm sure there are some out there. Uh, I, this is all information that I've come on over the years um, myself, but uh, uh, there are good books on the history of agriculture by, uh, by Harlan is one, um, but I don't specifically have a book about plants in, in history this way. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> I had a question for you. What is your favorite plant that has like this historical significance? My favorite plant with historical significance? Well, now that is quite a question. <laughs> um, I guess I would have to say that uh, in my in my world, the, the most historically significant plant is the plant we call maize or corn. Um, it comes in a blizzard of different varieties, especially when you get to South America. South America has developed strains we call pod corn, where each kernel is in its own separate wrapping. Um, a few people have grown it in North America, but it never caught on because it's not economically viable to machine processing in any way. Um, corn comes in virtually every color in the visible spectrum, from black to yellow to red, orange, bright purple, blue. Uh, and many of these different colors uh, represent pigments that may have important roles in human health. Many plant pigments act as uh, viable antioxidants. Um, many of them belong to a group of materials um, called anthocyanins. Uh, for instance, the color of blue in blueberries. Uh, if you eat a lot of blueberries, the blue pigment actually acts as a significant antioxidant to protect your DNA and various um, cell processes. Um, and the other thing is that uh, this ingenious creation, almost exclusively by the indigenous peoples of the Americas, um, has taken so long to figure out how they did it. It's like you can't go into the wild and, and just lay out a bunch of plants on the table and say, okay, which one of these is wild corn? You know, there is no such thing. And if you, uh, if you looked at the little seeds of Teosinti that look almost like tubular driveway gravel, and, and you, someone said, oh, you know, that's going to be the most productive crop on the planet one day. Uh, I don't think that would have been easy to understand. Um, corn actually has some challenges, too. In fact, uh, because its vitamin B content is bound up a certain way, um, even though corn is a very good food, if you try to subsist on it forever without anything else, you lack enough vitamin B so that you come down with a very serious and ultimately life-threatening vitamin deficiency that has been called pellagra. And when corn took over Europe, it was used primarily to feed the poor people. And unlike Native Americans who balanced the maize in their diet with the game that they caught and the seeds that they grew and other things, when this was fed to people as their exclusive diet, they came down with this horrific 
ultimately fatal and if allowed to continue disease called pellagra. And it was later found that if you cooked corn in a lye or alkaline solution, it would release vitamin B content to be digested. And so you could prevent this uh, debilitating condition. But corn is a very complex subject. Uh, the history of corn is rich and exciting. You could make a movie out of it and it, people would, if you did it properly, it would have enough twists and turns and, and uh, life and death mysteries that you would actually have something. But uh, uh, I, don't, I don't see a big production company uh, going into the, uh, uh, <laughs> the biography of corn this way. <laughs> yeah. Will I be giving another... tours this summer, it says here. Um, I would like to be, and I hope to be, um, I am fully vaccinated. Um, I expect that by summer, a large percentage of the Michigan population will be fully vaccinated. But uh, we depend on university policy for our direction in these matters. And so we'll sort of have to see how this turns out. It will be my great pleasure to be giving tours again, because that's one of my, my favorite luxuries about being the curator of this garden. Uh, there's one other question in the Q&A. Do you know how many kinds of citronella plants there are? Citronella? Yeah. Um, the answer is no, I don't. Simply put. <laughs> I have never studied citronella and uh, look forward to doing so at some point, but uh, not today, apparently. <laughs> <sighs> I don't see any other questions, but thank you so much. Um, for everyone watching, be sure to check out Peter's other event tonight, the Seeds of Resistance with the Broad and a whole panel of other folks. And be sure to check out the rest of the Science Festival going on through April, and all the details can be found at sciencefestival.msu.edu. Thanks again, Peter. Well, thank you, and thank everyone for coming.